The information presented is for informational purposes only. The opinions expressed are not necessarily the opinions of any Daikin company. This information should not be confused for accounting, legal, medical, or other professional advice. Please seek advice from a qualified professional for any specific questions. Welcome to the Accelerated HVAC Success Program. My name is Ben Middleton. I'm the National Sales Training Manager for the Goodman Amana and Daikin Brands. Today, we're joined with Crystal Williams from Lemon Seed Marketing. Crystal, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm so excited. It's not too far from home, so I'm excited to be here. So tell me a little bit, how in the world did you get started with Lemon Seed Marketing? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, I call myself a hashtag trade baby. Okay. So <laughs> basically, I grew up in this industry. Uh, my grandfather started our business. Um, my family's heating and air conditioning business after he was retired from the Navy in the in the mid 70s um, and then my dad took over and then my brother took over and that's who I have to listen to today is mostly that uh, pesky younger brother ironically but uh, he and I just kind of took off I guess you would say I did decide that I was not going to stay um, in the HVAC business when I graduated college um, but then my brother called me in 2014 and he said hey I'm getting ready to buy the business from dad and I really want to take it to the next level I need somebody to come and organize all of our marketing get our brand on point help me with recruitment and mm -hmm. retaining employees and would you be interested in coming back and coming on full-time and so I thought about it for just a few minutes and then I was like you know this would be a good opportunity so ran off from there started doing all of that Trey and I and uh, really started kind of getting noticed for how fast the company was growing so I started doing a little side hustle um, <laughs> and managing branding and advertising strategies for uh, companies across the United States that I had just met through some different um, best practice groups and things like that and before I knew it I had a full-fledged business um, on my hands and so my brother said remember when I called you in 2014 and asked you to take a chance well how about we take a chance on opening up this company um, had a really good friend of mine that was fantastic at corporate design um, helping make condensers and backflow preventers look sexy again um, <laughs> through graphic design and so I uh, asked her to be a part of it and here we are today about three years in um, and we have about 32 employees that work for Lemon Seed um, and we are half remote and half in off Office, but come a long way but we live eat and breathe uh HVAC and so it's one of our it's it's who we are so I love it so I want to start off you spit out a bunch of vocabulary words and I think <laughs> there's so much confusion that comes into all of this stuff so okay. the three things that I hear people use all the time is advertising mm -hmm. branding marketing can you help us understand the difference between all of this stuff? What in the world is branding? What is marketing? What is yeah. advertising? So it's a big bunch of confusion. <laughs> but <laughs> at the end of the day, this is where I, this is the way I look at things. You know, we can we can really base everything on the cornerstone of what how we're going to move forward. How are we going to grow a company? Any company? Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to grow that? And that's about making a brand it means how am I going to make people feel about my company how do I want to make people remember me I need to be memorable mm -hmm. so what am I going to do to be memorable so is it my name is it a mascot is it a specific bright wild color um, lots of things can be the brand like who who are you um, to people and it sounds like it's super corny right like dudes really don't jump on this bandwagon very easy because <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of it, people feel like oh my gosh it's so corny but really at the end of the day why do we buy anything that we buy? Why do we make anything? Why do we choose anything that we choose? And it's because we somehow have a connection to those things. And so your brand has to make a connection with people in, that you want to be your customers. And then we move to marketing, which is the overall strategy of how we're going to grow our business through advertising. Mm. And that's, it's, that's just the way I've, I've taught myself through college and things like that. Um, and so marketing is a, is a strategy. It's a way that we go and get things done, but these advertising tactics. So your digital provider, your direct mail provider, mass media, whether it's radio or billboards or TV, all of those things make up all of those advertising, uh, advertising tactics make up your marketing strategy. Um, but then your brand has to be what you promote through your advertising. So they all three kind of have to be on the same page, not kind of, they 100% need to be on the same page. Um, and that's another reason that Lemon Seed was born is because so many people um, were making these advertising choices of where to spend their money because it was the um, most um, 
urgent sales guy mm-hmm. was calling him like, well, the local guy came by and said I had to be on the radio. And like, he gave me a great deal. And I'm like, you have no brand. Um, <laughs> so what are you putting out there? You know, um, so branding, I'm super passionate about branding um, and the long term effects that it'll have on your family's wealth, um, building wealth for your your generations to come for mm-hmm. your business. And so I'm very passionate about that piece. And then advertising changes um, because what's popular you know, back in the day, I can still tell you I have some clients that phone books are still performing. Hate me if you want to. Um, and people are like shocked, like phone books. But I'm like, 100 uh, percent phone books. I still have companies that spend ten thousand dollars a year, generate three and four hundred thousand dollars out of a tangible phone book. I can't help it that we live in the backwoods of East Texas and Tennessee and Arkansas. <laughs> it's just what happens. Right. But then then you turn around and you have all these cool digital things like digital TV, digital mm-hmm. radio. So you have to your tactics have to sway, but your brand doesn't. Your brand needs to stay very intentional about who you are. That's really helpful. So tell me a little bit. You've worked with a lot of companies all over North America. So sure. tell me a couple of success stories that you've had with branding. Sure. So, um, well, my family's company is a good example of, you know, we had this uh, three generations logo. Um, we got ready to private label equipment. And so we launched another another tag off of our brand another accentuating piece to our brand i mean so that just really took off so people now recognize sailor mac that was my grandfather that's my um the mascot that we use but i had another company in oklahoma who um was basically just had a very generic brand um basically it was a house it had an electrical plug that came out of the top of it in the logo (laughs) and so when i talked to him i was like oh so you do electrical he was like no why do you think i do electrical i was like well sir your logo has a whole electrical outlet plug at the top of it so i do assume that you do electrical but he actually went all pink bright pink and uh, i remember having this specific conversation i said now this you're going to own this like you don't just go bright pink you Mm -hmm. have to own that you're going to go bright pink he did that and i remember one of the stories that he was telling our designer uh, my partner in limousine emily he was like you know i wrapped my first truck and he said like two or three days later people were like man how many trucks do you have on the market and he was like you know i knew i only had one but because it was such a statement piece people automatically started like assuming that i was a lot larger than my company really was and then we launched a jingle for him the pink van tex do the job best Uh and we just really owned that piece and so it was very successful for him still to this day very successful for him um one one thing it's not so much a success story it it's it's kind of a lesson that i've learned is brands have a lot of emotional tie to people Mm -hmm. Uh, you know when you start your company and you build this brand or your uncle designs it or whatever it looks like for you and what happens is you have emotional connection to it but unfortunately the world or the community and the market that you want to be they don't have that same emotional connection Um, and so I've seen a lot of companies that would have exponential growth if they were just willing to be a little bit more risky with their look and feel Um, another good example I have a awesome client in um, Indiana and he had a great name. Um, unfortunately, it was very similar. The name was very similar to his main comp- competition. Hmm. Literally, like, very, very close. Um, to the point where I'm like, you buying your own name is like buying your competition name digitally. But I said, we've got to get a differentiator in here. And so we created a mascot that was built around him. Um, and he's like, oh, my gosh. Like, I'm not getting in that thing. Like, I don't want people talking to me about that. But we created this mascot so that it could be a differentiator. He didn't want to change his name, which was fine. But we had to come up with something so that people could make an emotional connection to his company. So when we created the character, we had the mascot fully made into a parade-quality mascot. We started putting the mascot on sides of their trucks and on the billboards. And now he says, people know the, that mascot more than they know the name of my company. Mm-hmm. And so now we have to buy all of those keywords. His digital company was like, oh, goody, <laughs> a whole nother <laughs> set of keywords to buy. Um, but it was a really good move for him um, and understanding like how we are really going to own who we are in the market um, to really be a differentiator and not just get stuck behind, well, I'm doing digital marketing. Why am I not? Why is it not working? Well, everyone's doing digital marketing and everyone has a logo. How are you standing out? What are you doing that's different? So, Crystal, again, branding, this is such a a broad topic and there's a lot to know. What are the key elements that every listener that we have here should be paying attention to when they're trying to figure out, you know, what do I do for a branding strategy? So I was sitting I was sitting with a uh, with another another person that does this a lot. um, And he and I were visiting at a show and uh, he said, hey, I got this 
client, would y'all be interested in doing some off uh, design work for me? And I said, sure. He said, I have a couple of clients that need to rebrand. I said, sure. And he said, can you do me a favor? And I said, well, sure. And he said, when I send them to you, will you help them write a brand story and not just give them a logo? And so I was like, sure. Why, why do you say that? You know, like, why is that not a part of the discovery process? And he said, oh no, a lot of people just go get a logo that they think looks good and there's no emotional connection. Yeah. So the first thing that I would tell contractors that they need to do is their logo, their, their brand is not just their logo. Your logo should be the visual interpretation of what your brand is, but not the, it's not the only thing that makes up brand. And so I would tell you, like, you really need to do some discovery and some out loud collaboration with your design team because let's say you see a really cool design that's got palm trees and parrots on it but you have zero connection to the palm trees or the parrots or you live in west texas and you're not literally making a whole play on the fact like bringing the ocean to the desert and you just like it because it looks good you're gonna have a really hard time getting buy into that brand because there's no story there right um if your logo is three letters of some sort of initial combination that you came up with and a red and blue swoosh you are literally in the top percentile of people uh, of, of owners. That's literally what I see every day. You named it something because you went out on your own, right? And you just wanted to get something that you could get on the side of your truck and you did it. There's really not a connection for your community to make to that name. They forget that name. They're not going to search that name. And so it isn't that you need to change the name, but you need to tell the story. Yeah, one of our trainers we used to always work with always talked about the flames and snowflakes. Oh, yes. Flames, <laughs> snowflakes, sunshines, blue and red swooshes. <laughs> and people will be like, oh, I think my logo looks really good. And I want to be clear here. It isn't the visual look of it that may not be good. It's... Th Again, branding is about standing apart, mm -hmm. being different. You can be different with red and blue. So McWee, my, my brother's company, we're red and blue. We weren't going to change that. We're very, very legacy focused. That is our brand. Legacy, three generations. So we're not out here trying to be lime green because that's not who we are. Who we are are a retired Navy veteran three generation business. And so we're a lot more traditional looking, but we still stand out through other elements like Sailor Mac and things like that. But you have to be able to tell a story with your brand. And I know some people are like, "There's, I don't have a story. There's no story. There 100% is a story. Last story that I'll tell you, because um, I love this story. <laughs> I had this guy, he's a contractor in Tennessee, and he calls me and he's like, hey, um, you know, this is this is the name of my company. And so I said, oh, so I'm just, let's say it was called Blue Road Heating and Air Conditioning. So I was like, oh my gosh, so do you live on Blue Road? No is the road like blue pavement? <laughs> Why blue road? And he goes, I used random name generator. And I said, so there is no connection to this at all. No, ma'am, no connection. So I was just really like, oh my gosh, we had to start from ground zero to write the story because he didn't want to change the name. He'd invested a lot of money in like URLs and things like that, but he didn't want to change the name. So we had to start backwards and write a story that helped him be able to talk about why it was called Blue Road Heating and Air Conditioning. And so a lot of people I think are in that boat, but I would tell you the first place to start when it comes to getting a brand strategy is what is the story? What is the true meaning behind who you are, what you are? And if you're a family company and those three initials are your grandpa, you and your dad, then tell people that. Mm -hmm. Tell the story of how you've three generations and you grew up this way. I'll let you be in the trade baby category over here with me. Um, and so there's some cool things there, but also just that brand story is so important to all the other elements that you're going to launch. Um, another piece would be getting some, getting your budget together, or you understand that you have to invest in telling people your story mm -hmm. and how does that play into, um, moving forward? You know, how does that play into the then bottom of the sales funnel type things? So like the digital pieces and things like that. Um, so those are the two main things that I would tell contract contractors that you need to have in your, your mind wrapped around. So one of the things I know when you think of the big major brands out there like mm -hmm. uh, McDonald's mm -hmm. uh, and you know McDonald's they always say they don't make the best hamburger in the whole entire world but they are consistent when you yes. go to McDonald's anywhere in the world you yes. know exactly what you're going to get and so one of those aspects that I think is part of a strong brand is the trust mm -hmm. that the consumer has uh, in in that brand sure. as far as what the experience is they're going to get so how do you help clients develop that sense of trust within their community, within their customer base, as they're trying to grow that brand and position in their marketplace? Sure. So the customer experience is what we talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and it is about how we, as a company, 
are going to make an impact on our community, on our employees, and on our customers. And so those three things are key elements to success there in the customer experience, which sounds a little off because I think people are like, well, I answer the phone well, um, that should work. But really, it's about doing what you say you're going to do and being professional about it. Right now, I got a new pool. Uh, well, it's not a pool, it's a hot tub. But my neighbor got a pool and I got a hot tub. So we were looking for a company to come and service their pool and my hot tub. And so I couldn't find anybody. I couldn't get anybody to call me back. I couldn't get anybody to answer the, like even answer emails. And I was so frustrated because I was like, this does not make me feel like you are prioritizing service right just because i'm not ready to buy a new something from you now you don't want to service it so i use that that example a lot to talk about when we are um building out our brand and building out how we're going to how we are going to impact our community it requires every touch point that you're going to have with a consumer to be excellent as best as you can control it and so one of those things is of course the first thing that they're going to see is your advertising most of the time. Mm. And so your advertising needs to be clean. It needs to be crisp. It needs to be accurate. It needs to be um, up to date. So if you've had a billboard up for three years, it's time to change it, right? I mean, it's faded. And so that's what people, people make that connection. As I was driving here a couple of weeks ago, I was coming up here um, to this facility and one of our, one of my brother's company's billboards, the whole side of it was folding down. And I was like, absolutely not. Because that makes, that is a direct reflection on the brand. So if you start there and you start really auditing what your consumers are experiencing mm -hmm. in the community with your brand. So are you sponsoring um, Little League baseball teams and, you know, cheerleading squads and Friday night footballs and things like that? Are you sponsoring Habitat for Humanities, things like that? And if you are, are you telling people that you're doing it? And is your brand appropriately displayed where it needs to be so that people are making this connection of their advertising looks good. They're active participating members of our community that care about our kids and our nonprofit groups. And then the other thing I would say is it matters how your team answers the phone, how they arrive at the house, how they present options. How do you tell somebody you got a grounded compressor and you need a whole new system? Right. All of those things matter with the overall impression and the customer experience with your brand. And so if somebody's going to pull up in a raggedy vehicle, right, they're going to park in the middle of my driveway and drip oil and put a cigarette out and button their top three buttons are undone and they, they got a dirty hat on with big sweat rings and they knock on my door and they're like, I'm here to fix your AC. And there's that's the that's the feel that you're putting out there. So I would make sure that every single aspect of every encounter that a consumer might have with my brand is at the level that it needs to be. So we don't park in the driveway, we park on the street. We don't knock, we ring doorbells, we take two steps back from the door, we shake hands, we introduce ourselves, we give our business card, all of those things. And listen, that takes a lot of work, Ben. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. That takes a lot of work yeah. um, to keep that going because if not, <clears throat> what happens is you lose track of something. You'll have really good advertising, but then your technicians are struggling. Or you have CSRs that their booking rate is 40%. Absolutely not, right? That that can't be. You're spending all this money to make the phone ring, and only 40% of the time is your team doing a good enough job to book the call. And so, unfortunately, the, the customer journey, the customer experience with your brand, it is deep and it is a long experience. Because then after they have their first service with you, now it's about how do I stay top of mind with them? And so, your, that journey with your brand, again, it sounds corny and people are like, blah, blah, blah. But I'm telling you, if you want to win the long game and you want to be in business and you want to grow and you want to have healthy growth and be able to maintain that growth with capacity and, and affordability on a brand, then you will invest in that customer journey at the beginning. You know, as you're talking about that, you know, the one thing that keeps popping in my mind is the importance of brand standards. You know, the, your employees, if they know that you really pay attention to those brand standards and everything else you do, they're going to adhere to that brand standard when they go have an interaction with a customer. Absolutely. But if you don't care about how your company looks over here, then the employees aren't going to care about, you know, what they do when they're going out and meet with the customer. I mean, you know, we installers are a good example. Installers will be the dirtiest people, right? They're climbing. They've got putty all on their pants and shirts, and they're trying to work in T-shirts. I mean, they're hot. And they're, mm -hmm. But we've we've tried to coach them like, hey, you know, you actually are in the home the longest amount of time. Homeowners are normally exposed to our installers longer than they are exposed to any other member. Maybe the sales guy, if he's doing a great job of coming back on the day of install, mm -hmm. but odds are he's on to 
to the next thing. And so, you know, our installers and really like that's one thing that's hard to hold them accountable because they're hot. They're tired. They're, you know, it's 140 degrees here in Texas in attics. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard to be like, oh, by the way, smile, shake hands, don't stink. Um, make sure your uniform <laughs> looks correctly. Make sure you pick up all the trash. And they're just like, ma'am, can I just get this in the attic and get this installed? <laughs> um, and so, but what they've learned is every other aspect of that customer experience has had to be had to be impactful and above guard, like above what everyone else in our market's doing. And so we're like, hey, did you clean up your trash? So they have to do a, a follow-up call-in, like a check-in. Hey, I'm done here. Miss Smith, thank you so much for letting me come out here. Here's my card. If you have any questions, call the office. You know, I know that, you know, Shay came out and sold you this system. If you have any problems, they've got to communicate because that is one of our core pieces is that we communicate with our customers and we over-communicate. Let me run through if you notice any trash and all of those things are important because that's how, if we're going to charge, if we're going to be the highest people in the market, which we are, mm -hmm. we have to provide the utmost level of customer service. You can't have both, right? You can't have a low expectation of service and then have the highest ticket on the market. Right. You got to, you know, that brand better exude excellence or you're going to struggle to maintain it. You might get it for a little while, but eventually it's going to catch up with you. So tell me a little bit, most HVAC companies are either local or uh -huh. regional. Uh -huh. So tell me a little bit about uh, that and how does branding play a role in standing out in that localized market? So, you know, my favorite part of marketing I can get on my soapbox is community engagement. It's one of my favorite ways to make a long-term impact. Um, and so when we're talking localized things, I tell my contractors, you know, you may not care about. So, uh, again, let me just forewarn everybody that's watching and listening. You know, I'm a Texas girl, so Friday night football is like what people do here. Um, and so, it, and that's a very popular thing for a lot of my contractors. And so I tell people all the time, you want to be where the people are. You need to take your brand where people are, even when they're not looking for you. Um, and so if it comes down to supporting, if you've got a little baseball team that's going to the nationals, you may not give two flips, <laughs> okay? Right. You don't have a grandkid, you don't have a friend, you ain't got a son, a daughter, nobody doing that. But what you do is you make this connection and say, oh my gosh, you know, Yellow Bear Air is proud to support the die ball 10U all-star team headed to nationals in Alabama. And you do that, and you make a post on social media, you invite that team to your office, you put the mascot with them, you give them an ice chest full of Gatorade, tell them to go fight win, you're going to do great things, and put it on social media and say, can we get some support? support for the die ball, you know, baseball team. You do things like that and you are making inroads in your community because what happens is people start associating your brand, the name of your company with community support. And a lot of people now are looking for that philanthropic approach to things and they want to know that you care about the community. And a second, like just an extra perk on top of that is giving your employees this, we have this $250. It's, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. You empower your team members with this $250, basically allowance where they can sit at their kids all-star game. And when the coach says, all right, guys, we got to sell sponsorships. The sponsorships are a hundred dollars. You don't want them to say, well, let me get with my boss, right? Empowering that technician that has been working for you over and over mm. through hot summers and installing and selling for you. And they get the power at a little league game to say, oh, my, my company's in for a hundred bucks, easy. Go ahead and sign us up for that. And then all they have to do is request that a hundred dollars um, towards, towards their kids' baseball team. And all of a sudden they're the hero in that meeting and they walk away like, yeah, that's, you know, that's my company. And who cares that they get a little bit of the glory? Like, let them have it. Right. Um, they're the ones working for you in the heat, you know? So those are some th fun things and sponsoring footballs at a football. So no, sir, if you're expecting to sell five units off of those plastic footballs that they throw at the football game don't do it because that's not <laughs> what's going to happen but what does happen is you know somebody's going to catch that football for their kid and they're going to look at it and go oh yellow bear air oh my gosh that's really nice and they're going to hand it off to their kid but then later on that next summer when they go in there they've heard and seen your name so much through advertising through community engagement and through your wrapped vehicles and things like that, that now you are the first person that pops into their brain. Um, it's not a one track, you know, you've got to do this local connection to people. Um, and I, I just, my brother's company, our part of our, 
um, set of how we're structured is a community marketer in each market. And people are like, y'all have a full-time employee that all they do is make inroads in the community? Yes, we do. We 100% do. If we have a brick and mortar, odds are we have a community marketer in that market. And all their job is to take care of our employees. So if somebody's having a baby, we're the first ones bringing food. Somebody's getting Mm -hmm. married, we're the first one trying to figure out how to get there, right? But also, we are identifying places in the community that we can plug our brand in. And then we're using the chambers of commerce and things like that to really own that guerrilla style boots on the ground marketing. And so that's local. That's how you win that local market. You know, you guys are so creative with all of the names that you come up with for companies and the campaigns and everything else. But if somebody was trying to, you know, we really need to establish our brand. We have to figure out who, are, who, who we are. Where does somebody start? How does a, a service contractor start? So, you know, my professional opinion is I like to trust the professionals mm. of things. So I would identify a good um, branding expert, which there's several in our industry that are experts in our own industry. Um, and what you need is someone to guide you through the thought process, right? At the end of the day, you are probably going to be the one that comes up with at least a really good start to your brand, your new name or your new look or your new mascot. It's going to come from you. Um, and companies like Lemon Seed, we just talk to you enough and we collaborate and we brainstorm and I call it spitballing. You spitball things uh, over and over again until you're all of a sudden it's like this beautiful prize emerges Um, and it takes collaboration from a creative out people that are creative Um, and so I would encourage you to partner with a vendor that has some experience in that that can then help you keep massaging those thoughts to where you really come out on the other end with with some good advice and listen I've seen some bad rebrands um Like some of it literally, and I know this again is corny, it makes me literally sick to my stomach sometimes because I will look and I'll be like, gosh, what they did is their buddy is a graphic designer. So they said, hey, I want to change my name. And they did this not thought out design. And then all of a sudden they've wrapped three trucks and put it on their building. And I'm like, this is terrible. This is not going to do what you want it to do. Um, but then they're already so monetarily invested in it and and time, so much time was spent in it that they can't bear the thought to start over. And I don't want to be the bearer of bad news right. all the time. So I just encourage you like to really investigate like who are some good vendor partners that can walk me through this. Honestly, you get what you pay for. So if you're going to pay somebody 300 bucks on Fiverr to go do it for you, you're going to get a $300 valued logo and that's not a brand you need somebody that's going to help you really collaborate on the brand and so to your point when you create your brand it should bleed over into like what do you call your team so we call our team the comfort crew is it is it earth shattering absolutely not um at lemon seed all of our all of our team are the seeds we'll say hey seeds uh, all of our podcast listeners are called lemon heads right because all I, I know that it's corny and but it's it's all tied back to my brand um but even we try to take it all the way down into the names of your systems if you're going to private label what does that look like um the um your your actual maintenance plan what is your maintenance plan and how can it connect back to your brand a lot of times i'm going to say well tell me about your maintenance plan they're gonna be like well it's called maintenance plan <laughs> you know what i'm like <laughs> oh okay um so it's called maintenance plan or something like that but really what I like to do is look at it and be like how can we bring this maintenance agreement to life to where when your technician is mentioning it and they're talking about it not only are they intrigued by the obvious good pieces of it but just the name and the connection like oh it's named after your dog listen pull the dog ticket card every time you can my husband's a veteran so I tell him all the time we're pulling the veteran card Pull the veteran card because sometimes that is just what helps people make a connection to you. Mm-hmm. Um, is it a dog? Is it a um, a veteran status? Are you female owned and operated? Ladies, I mean, I would be owning that. Um, and there's no shame in owning all those things. Are you black owned business? Are you a Hispanic owned business? Are you a third generation? Like your family has been here. Like all of those are cool stories. You just need to tell people and you just need to tie all of those pieces in together. And it really takes those synergies in, inside of your operations to really, again, I mean, how does your team answer the phone? They should answer the phone. Like, again, if you're a pirate company, they should really answer the phone. Ahoy, this is Crystal. No, it's corny. But again, people are going to be laughing by the time they're talking to you in one of their worst days. Like their air is Mm. out in Texas. And you just said ahoy (laughs) when you answered. But again, it's all about making those branding connections. So 
uh, kind of building on that, let's talk a little bit about unique selling propositions. So mm -hmm. when we talk about the unique selling proposition, I hear so many guys, well, I offer 24 hour emergency service yeah, so and does you know, everyone else. seven days a week. <laughs> uh, you know, we've got all uh, trained technicians. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, the well, not unfortunately, actually, fortunately, a lot of those things have become the norm. So I, I say this, you know, when my dad um, first started truly marketing, probably in about 2011 or so, he really invested in marketing. He went in 10% of our revenue goal. We really started marketing. One of the things that he really started focusing on is what differentiates us? Well, at the time, wrapped vans was a differentiator. Nobody else where we lived had a wrapped van. Everybody looked like kidnappers other than us, <laughs> right? We looked, we had a good brand, a good looking feel going on. So we wrapped trucks and we thought we were cool because mm -hmm. we wrapped one piece of it. We didn't wrap the whole thing at the time. We did that. We had a radio jingle, right? Well, now, well, and we were open 24 hours and we had on-call technicians. Now, it, it, that is not, that's it, the expectation, and our industry, thankfully, has continued to evolve. Um, because I look at other industries, because Lemon Seed will serve some other industries as well, a few others that are still home service based, and they are light years behind the HVAC business. And so it's a good problem to have, but also it's an expensive problem because a lot of times what you think makes you a differentiator really just makes you the norm. And there's no time to be the norm. We're not going to be the norm. We have to be We have to be innovative and we have to be new. So uh, now I think there's a lot of unique things that goes around the equipment that you offer, financing that you offer, the accessibility um, to um, ways to reach out to my company. So do you have where I can chat? Can I, can, you know, for a while during COVID people were doing the, uh, virtual visits mm -hmm. and things like that. So again, you know, what are you doing? That's an innovative way. Cause now people are looking for ease of access. Um, like I can tell you, like if, if you called me and said, uh, you have a four hour window, I can be at your house anytime between eight and 12. I'm going to say, can you give me 20 minutes notice? Cause I'll just go home right. when you need me there. Or now I can open my front door from my office and let you in my home and see every move you make inside of my home. So why do you need me there? Well, you really need me there so that we can make a connection. So now that's why it's even more important that we're making any connection. So when I called to book my appointment, what if that is my only connection? And so you really have to think about what sets you apart. Everybody has, most people are offering emergency service. Most people have trained technicians or they're going to tell you that they do. And as an average consumer, how do we even check that? We don't know. Uh, we don't, we don't, we think we know. So a little pro tip here on social media, if you truly are training your techs, why are you not posting that on social media? Mm -hmm. Especially those of you that do like cool, these cool VR things. Like that would be all over my social media for recruitment and retaining, but also showing, actually showing my community, like look at my team training on how to serve you better. So we don't just say we're trying the highest trained technicians. We show you, um, those are differentiators, but just saying it doesn't get you very far anymore. And so you really have to dig deep into what makes you different. Is it, you know, um, guaranteed, service within four hours now that would have killed some of y'all during this texas heat wave mm -hmm. um but guaranteed next day install of equipment do you keep enough equipment equipment on hand to be able to do that so there's lots of cool things that you can do but i need everybody to start thinking past the basic things that were coming out i'm going to say the 80s i was born in the 80s but i'm going to say <laughs> the 80s um in the 80s when all of this really started coming about um but listen also um not being on paper is another thing like people want you to email them their invoice. Even older people, as we say, an older demographic is even getting to where they want electronic communication for documentation and things like that. So I really encourage you to think deeper than family owned and operated and things like that. So now you've mentioned a, a whole lot of stuff right there. <laughs> I mean, you were talking about social media, you were talking about email and stuff. How important is digital marketing and advertising uh, for sure. the home service industry today? So uh, digital marketing has to be a huge piece of your marketing strategy. Um, and so the advertising pieces of, of, of digital that come into play, SEO, which is all the wording. I, I give basic generic things here, but, you know, I'm not a digital expert, mm -hmm. but I will say I do know enough to know that I need to be investing in search engine optimization. I need to be investing in paid ad strategy. Um, so those of you that hate PPC or Google local service, things like that, you might hate it, but it's a necessary evil, as I say, to be relevant when people are searching for, if they 
haven't made a connection with your brand. Listen, you want to save yourself money on digital? Build your freaking brand. Build your brand where they start searching for you and not a, not going free agent out there like, hey, who would like to service my air conditioning unit? Because everyone, a million people <laughs> and lots of companies, and that's why it becomes aggressive there. But also like trusting your digital company to help you get a good strategy in place for that that includes act, new customer acquisition that's a non-branded search. How do you stay there when your brand is searched? And then what about just interrupter ads when people really aren't looking for your service, but you're offering duct cleaning or now you've got supplemental air like through um, through um, extra, extra pieces of equipment that people can add to their home, whether it's ductless or IAQ. <clears throat> and just how you can make yourself available for them and using digital marketing is the fastest way to get there. Um, and so I say this all the time, when your brand is right and your digital strategy is right, you will be a winner in today's market. And then the rest of the marketing, the rest of our advertising is going to be icing on the cake, a true continuation of you know growing that new customer acquisition. But I'm gonna tell you that 40 to 50% of your advertising budget needs to be spent on digital. So putting together all of, all of that, it all goes back to branding, right? You it have all, to have a strong branding all strategy roads lead in to order branding. to do that. So part of branding is the story. Yes. And I'm going to go back to some of the other major brands that are out there because the story doesn't necessarily need to be the founding story. I mean, it can just be a story that resonates, right? You think about uh, Coca-Cola and the bear. I mean, there's some great stories that the bear and the cub has uh, around Coca-Cola. You think of uh, McDonald's and Ronald McDonald and the adventures with the Hamburglar and Grimace and all yes. of the other people that are out there. Uh, how do you put together that story as a home service business that's going to really resonate with your audience that you have? Yeah, so a lot of my contractors right now, like maybe they bought the company. So the company that they own is not even their own last name. Yeah. You know, um, I have a client right now that's a roofing client and she bought a company. It's got these initials. And I was like, who is this? And she's like, oh, that's like three owners ago. But there's so much equity and time mm. into building that brand that it's probably not worth rebranding the whole thing. So she and I had to sit down and instead of rewriting the story of the, it, the name, we created for her a mascot that we could tell the story around the mascot. And so what you really need to do, if you want to do this yourself, like just sit down and start brainstorming. I would just start with like, why are you in business? Mm -hmm. Okay. So why, why did you buy an air conditioning company or a heating company? Um, but for what was it for financial freedom? Was it for freedom of your own work schedule? Was it to bring your family and provide your family places to work? Was it to serve the community? You know, what was that story? And you literally just have to start jotting down bullet points of why you do what you do. Then the next thing that I think you can move to is what's important to you. A good example of that is when we were rebranding a local client here in Houston, um, the name of his company was very um, industrial. And so when we started thinking, he was telling us about his wife having this disease, um, and it was a it was a long term disease. And so just while he was talking, I was writing down all of those things. And again, he thought that had nothing to do with his brand story, but eventually, as we talked through, he had created his own filter, little filter company, um, and his wife suffered from a disease that had a color associated with it. You know, most diseases have a, a ribbon color. And so we ended up coming up with this company new name for him that was because he was a very um, nerdy and he was very um, calculating in what he did. And so we thought he was very wise. And so we created this wise name of his company. And then what, what is wise? Owls are wise. So then we created an owl. And then his wife's disease that she suffers from had a blue ribbon so then we had a blue owl and all of a sudden before he knew it we had this whole brand story that we had put together from him just telling his life story what he dealt with every day being a caregiver um, and how he really was passionate about creating solutions and he wanted to be service oriented and things like that so we created this whole brand that had nothing to do with the fact that he had bought the company three years ago and all these things it was now like who we are now and what is important to us and he gets a lot of people that are like oh my gosh y'all give back to this organization for this el this illness that his wife has and we talk about it it gives us great content sure. for 
social media and great outlets for community involvement. And it just gave him a focus. And so that's all from just stopping and starting, just open up notes on your iPhone and just start jotting down things like, are you, you know, are you a veteran or do you raise seeing eye dogs? Do you raise, I mean, have you had a farm all of your life? I mean, all of those things matter when you sit down to build out a brand, who you were, where you came from, maybe things you've overcome. Um, and those of you that maybe you're like, gosh, I don't have a sob story, Crystal. Like, I don't, I mean, I just, I'm just a hardworking guy. So then we go the direction of blue collar and working hard all of your life. There's just a way to be a good storyteller, but we just need the key components. So you got to start writing down your story as much as you hate to do it. Just open up those notes and over the next couple of months, just type, write out bullet points. Um, and then when you sit down with someone, you can start writing that story out. So talking about rebranding, there's a lot of companies, you talked about the Yellow Pages early on and in some markets that may still be a, a viable option that's out there. But uh, with the Yellow Pages came a lot of AAA heatings and air conditionings, a lot of yes. A1 services and uh, alike. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of those companies today are probably struggling because AAA really doesn't mean anything to me. No. A1 services doesn't mean anything to me. So how does a company go about this rebranding journey? Yeah, so... Um, it is scary to rebrand a larger company, um, mainly financially scary. So I'll be the first one to admit that. But um, I have a contractor right now. She's sitting at about $7 million a year uh, in a, in a relative. She's close to a metro area, but her brand has been her brand for a long time. And it's her family's last name. And, and so she and I were talking the other day and she goes, Crystal, I just, if I rebrand everything, like it changes everything. And I said, it doesn't change everything. It, re, in, it reinvigorates everything, right? So you have to make your mind up that you are going to invest in the fact that you're going to reinvigorate your brand in your market. You're going to re-energize it. You're going to bring it a whole new life because you should be building on what you've already built, right? So if you already have this good company, such and such sons, heating and air conditioning that you've been, your grandpa started and it's 50 years old. But now it's just not serving and you need to change it. Let's say you have a five-year goal to sell your company and you're like, I, it can't be my name. I, mm -hmm. You know, we can, you can sit down and start looking at like, what have we, what are we known for? And how do we start writing the story now? Your story is just different. And the next thing is, and this gets a little bit on the operational side is you did start building out a schedule. So like, how am I going to get this done? You start literally scheduling. Well, I know I've got to buy five new trucks this year. And so those five are going to be the first ones that get wrapped in our new look and feel. I'm going to have a ribbon cutting with my chamber. I'm going to start all of my email signatures starting the day that, that truck hits the road. I've got new email signatures. I've got new building signage. All of those things can happen in a strategized timeline. Um, to where eventually, but when you look up, you are fully rebranded. But you got to start telling the story about why you changed. And so that people are super nosy, right? We're nosy, naturally. So we're like, huh, I wonder what's going on. Like right now, again, I live in a smaller town. And so anytime somebody starts construction on a building, everybody starts blowing up social media. Like what's going in that building? What's going in that building? I promise you, you roll one new truck with a new name. And you put a magnet on the side of that truck that's temporary that says formerly Yellow Bear Air, now Honey Bear Air, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this sticker on there or this magnet that you're going to pull off in a few months, but it's form. All of a sudden, what is going on with them? What happened? Are they going out of business? Are they having money troubles? Listen, I don't care if you're talking about me as long as you're talking about me right? I just need you to be talking about me a little bit. And so what happens is you just, again, you bring some new energy to that brand and then you start doing press releases and social media videos about how excited you are that you've grown over the years and look what your company has evolved to. And then people are like, well, if they're that successful, I want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Now you're the, the cool kids are using you, right? right? Forget this other company over here that I've been using. Like this company's got new things happening and, and they're re reinvigorating it. But I do tell you, you need to consider your budget so you need to look down can you afford to wrap some vehicles my i always say the biggest vehicles in your fleet i'd love to wrap those first so you got big install vans riding around town let's let's wrap one of those you got a billboard campaign going let's launch it there new and improved look and feel formerly 
yellow bear air, and now there's just gigantic honey bear, you know, on the side. It will cause a stir. And a lot of times we need that stir uh, when we're trying to hurdle large numbers and overcoming large KPIs that we have in front of us. So I encourage you to not be afraid about it. It just takes a lot more intentionality about how you're going to go about it. And uh, another little pro tip is let's sell your team first. So the first thing I would do is we don't rule by committee. So as the owner, you need to make the decision. If you go asking everybody, you're never going to get anywhere. So don't run, don't run your company by committee. Run your company. You're the boss. Run the company. Um, and then when you decide and you get to that final look and feel, I encourage you to have a top secret launch party with your own team. They'll be the first one to have the new hats or new backpacks or new shirts. And you spoil them and their families first. And you let them figure out, oh, my gosh, this is going to be so cool. Now, all of a sudden, you've got 30, 50, 20 raving fans that are excited about your launch. Um, and it's a strategy. It's, it's a strategy to go about it. But it's, I say it's easy to do once you make your mind up that you're going to do sure. it. Yeah, it's fun. I get excited. I'm like, it's so fun. <laughs> Let's go rebrand some huge companies. Uh, it does give me heartburn. Um, we just refreshed McWilliams and Summer Brothers Company. We just mm -hmm. refreshed their brand. And it was a little scary because I was like, oh, my gosh, we've got like 70 vehicles on the road. Um, and, and my brother goes, well, I got to buy 10 more. And I was like, perfect. We'll start with those 10. <laughs> you know, and then we just literally start wrapping. The newer the truck is, the sooner it's going to get rewrapped. And it just works because our brands are complementary and just works. Well, Crystal, thank you so much yeah. for joining us. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, for all of you out there, that if you enjoyed this episode, please go ahead and like it. And then I would also encourage you to follow us so you can see all of the other upcoming episodes that we have. Crystal, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, absolutely. It was a blast. Thank you. Yes.